If you have your uh, Bibles tonight, and I pray that you do, turn with me again to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 9, I want to begin reading with verse 30. Mark chapter 9, beginning with verse 30. And they departed thence, and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying, and were afraid to ask him. And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked him, What was it that you disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves as to who would be the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desire to be first, that same shall be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them, and when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me, but him that sent me. And John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followed not us, and we forbode him, because he followed not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do, as, do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against me, or against us, is on our part. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hung around his neck than he were, and he were cast in the sea. And if I, thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where, thou, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter hold into life, and having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where the worm doth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye shall offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom with one eye, than having two eyes, and be cast into hell fire. fire. Where the worm doth not, and the fire is not quenched. For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltness, wherewith shall it season it? Have salt in your saddles, and have peace one with another. Almighty God, how thankful and grateful we truly are for this opportunity to be in your house again tonight. I thank you, Lord God, for each and every individual the chair, and I pray your blessings upon all of them. I pray, Lord God, that you'll be with special with those tonight who need me in a very special way. We pray for May and Brother Mayfield and his family, and just lift them up to you. We know that Norma is in a better place, and this dear sweet lady has suffered long and hard, but you promised us that when we suffer in this life, the glory will be much greater. So I can see her now. Oh, walking the streets of gold, enjoying her life, and just simply being what you've called her to be. Perhaps she may be singing up there. She had a beautiful voice, and we thank you, Lord God, for what she, her life has meant to us, to me as an individual, and to this church. So, Lord, we pray for them. Pray for the family. Pray for these others that have been mentioned here tonight, Lord. We lift them up to you in prayer and pray that if you is your will that you heal their bodies. Help them, Lord, to, to be uh, 
very in the very center of your will, doing the things that you'd have them to do, and then if this is the case, that we can come to you and cry to you, and you'll hear our prayer, and you'll answer it. Father, tonight I pray if there's one here who has never accepted you as a personal Savior, that tonight they would open up their hearts and invite the Lord Jesus Christ to come in. And Father, in these words that we've read tonight, you, you are trying to teach us a lesson, and I pray that we get it. I pray we understand what it is to be the church, to be the people of the kingdom of God, to be brothers and sisters in Christ. So help us, Lord, to be at peace, to love one another, and to do the things that you have called us to do. For we pray and ask all of this in the precious name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for his sake, amen. amen. Well, I want to talk to you. This is a, a long uh, passage of scripture, but it has so much to say to us. Jesus is leading his disciples to Jerusalem. They're going up to Jerusalem. And as they went, he reminded them of what would happen to him there. He would be betrayed, he would be killed, and then he'd be resurrected on the third day. You know, uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew's take on that says they were deeply graved about all oh, what Jesus is saying. However, it didn't seem to be graved enough to, to set aside personal disputes. <laughs> it's interesting over which one of them would be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Uh, I think there's a tremendous lesson there in that, you know, for God's people. By the way, you wouldn't think just offhand that the, the 12 apostles would, would be disputing among themselves. According to verse 50, they, perhaps they didn't get along too well. There was some dissension among them. And what Jesus is trying to say is that that, that should not be. Uh, he, I think he tries to teach them a lesson here on, on honor. And he sets a child before them and explained that the best way to be first was to be last. Well, you know, people don't like that. Uh, he says the way to be last, of course, is to be the servant of all. I think this is true humility. It means knowing yourself, being yourself, giving yourself for, for others. Helping other people, doing for other people. Don't always be number, try to be number one or, you know, be the big honcho or whatever it might be. You know, the world, in the world, if you're great, well, you have other people working for you, you know. Uh, but our Lord's message says that greatness comes not from having other people working for you, but by you serving other people. That you serve those that are in need. If you want to be first, well, be last and be a servant of all. <laughs> Not hit John, John's always asking questions. John asked the question, well, what about this man who's been casting out demons? We tried to get him to follow us, but he wouldn't do it. It's interesting what Jesus says here. He says, if he's not against me, then he's for me. You know, and, and if we're not against him, we must. he must be for us, he said. This anonymous man was bringing glory to the Lord Jesus Christ's name, so he had to be for him and not against him. You know, by the way, there's a lot of people who are doing great things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that perhaps we never hear about, we don't know about. And that's really the way it ought to be. You know, you don't have to march out here and put a big sign on you and say, look, I'm a, I'm a member of Friendship Baptist Church and I am all for the Lord. No, go out there and help somebody who's in need. Do something for someone. You know, be a servant. By the way, as, as we've noted many times before, the book of Mark is all about the servant, the servant, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to serve, you see. It, it's not necessary to perform some great miracle to prove our Lord, our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just simply being able to do what the Lord puts in our path to do, to help someone, you know, to go the extra mile. 
turn the other cheek, all of these things, you know. The Jews, of course, they didn't like that. But, you know, that's what Jesus had to say. And so he says, you know, if we uh, love as a child, then we, we'll do, you know, you ever notice children, how they, you know, they play together, they love one another. They may have a little squabble over a toy or something, but pretty soon they're hugging one another, and it's just it, it, so much uh, fun to watch them and to see how they do. That's the way we're to be. We're to love one another. We're to help one another. We're to serve one another. And when we're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, I think that's a high servant in all the world. I don't even know. Notice something else he says here, though, that there's to be peace in the family. The little ones refer to all of God's children who follow Christ and seek to serve him. Now, the way believers treat each other in the family of God is a serious thing, I think. You know, God wants us to be at peace with one another. You know, again, I say to you, it seems that the disciples are having some friction here. I know I can't quite understand why they would all want to be number one when there was Jesus with them and they knew that he was number one, but no, you know, they wanted to be number one. And so there's some dispute going on about this. Well, you know, that still happens in the body of Christ today. There are people who want to be in charge. They want to be number one. They want to be, you know, put on a pedestal and what have you. Uh, all of these things. And by the way, uh, in most churches, everybody wants to be the preacher because they know more than the preacher. So, you, you know, it's, uh, it's just... <laughs> It's just one of those deals. But hey, we're to love one another. We're to serve one another. We're to give. We're to help. It, it's, just, it's just tremendous when you see God's people doing things. That's truly. I, I just have to say this morning, uh, uh, Brother Bill's daughter left here, and I didn't know this, but uh, she said that when Chuck played, that song, that was her mother's favorite song, and she just tears streamed down her again. But she was so thankful unto God that he had played that uh, this morning. So thank you, Chuck. You did a great job. Praise God. You see, that's what it's all about. Doing what we know that will help people, to serve people, and live for people, and do what God would have us to do with our lives. But this message now, the latter part of this message has to do with Jesus' solemn message on a place called heaven. Now, as I said to you this morning, people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear about this place called hell. But Jesus spoke more about hell than he did heaven. And it's a serious matter and we need to give it some thought. You know, he says that we are to deal drastically with whatever sin is in our life, whatever it might be, whatever in your life that causes you to stumble. It must be removed. Now, I don't know, you know, uh, he says if your eye, you know, bothers you, causes you to sin, well, pluck it out. <laughs> your foot must be removed that causes sin. Now, the Lord here, you understand what's taking place here, don't you? The Lord is not talking, not, he's not commanding that uh, a literal surgery, that's not what he's talking about. What he is teaching, though, is sin. Sin comes from the heart. And we know that when there's a cancerous tumor or something in our bodies, it has to be cut out, it has to be taken out. And that's what Jesus is referring to you. And you've got sin in your life. Cut it out. Take it out. Do something about it, you know. Some are so shocked when they hear Jesus, you know, these frightening words that he has about, to say about hell. But notice how many times now he mentions this. <laughs> Boy, 
he says in uh, in verse uh, uh, okay, let me get it right here. 43, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life main than having two hands and go into hell, into the fire that never is quenched, where the worm doth not and the fire is not quenched. Notice he talks about how many times he says here the fire is not quenched, where the worm doth not, if thy eye offend thee, if the foot offend thee, cut it out, cut it off, and it's better to enter halt in the life than have two feet and uh, can be cast into hell and into the fire that never is quenched. Where the worm, worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. Again, he says, of the eye, the same thing. And verse 48, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Boy, I'm, do you get that? How terrible, how awful this place called hell really is. You know, I don't know why people are so uh, so afraid, you know, to hear the word hell or to hear somebody preach about it, hear somebody talk about it. Hell is a place of torment. It's a place of punishment. And... Revelation 20.10 says hell is not a temporary place. And that's where you go there and, you know, you get, you get a little hot and then you leave. No, it's a permanent place. And you'll stay there forever. It, it makes it so serious that when, when uh, we know that someone has never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to do everything we can possibly do to see that they're converted that they're brought to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why, that's why Christians must share the gospel. I don't know about you, but if you have someone in your family, someone in your family who does not know Jesus, I know, I know this, it's hard sometimes to witness to your family. You know, perhaps it's harder to witness to your family than anyone else. But you must do it. Because if they leave this whole world and never accept Jesus as their personal Savior, they're going to this place that Jesus is talking about. A place called hell where the worm never dies and the flowers never quenched. Jesus was surely wanting his disciples to see and to know that. You know, <clears throat> some say, some people say, well, that's, that's just too much to ask, you know. <laughs> Jesus uses the concept of a living sacrifice. By the way, Paul wrote in, in Romans chapter 12, you know, that we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God, you know. The Jews, by the way, the Jews were not allowed to put the honey or leaven on their sacrifice. They used salt, you see. Now, salt refers to purity. Salt refers to purity and preservation, you see. The disciples, what Jesus is saying to his disciples is this. Listen, you're the salt of the world. You're God's salt. But they were in danger of losing their flavor. And a lot of Christians now... If you're a child of God, don't get me wrong at this point. If you've been saved, if you've been washed in the blood of the crucified Son of God and you're saved, you're on your way to glory. But if you've got sin in your life, dear friend, you need to cut it out. You need to do something about it. You're in danger of losing your saltness, your effectiveness. People listen. People know if you've got sin in your life. They can see it. You don't have to get up and, and say, listen, you know, I've sinned or done something like that. People just know. They'll understand. And if they know that there's something in your life that's not right, I'm telling you right now, you will not be able to witness to them. You'll not be able to tell them about Jesus. Because they'll always say to you, well, I'm just as good as you are. You know. God's people are to live in a way that puts them above the rest of the people out there in the world. 
I don't care what people say, you know, don't put yourself up, you know, like you're somebody or something. No, you can do it. You can do it as a, as a servant, as a servant of Christ, you see. And that's what Jesus is saying to his disciples. Listen, you're the salt of the world, salt of the earth. By the way, we're the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. I don't know how bright your light shines. I don't know how much salt you're putting out or any of those things, but listen to me. That's what we're to do. We're God's family. We're God's children. We need to do it. You know what? The, these disciples should have been examining their own hearts. You know what they're doing? Oh, they're fussing between one another. Which one of us is going to be grace? You know, I don't know. In the kingdom of God, you know. Which one's going to be number one? You know, <laughs> but they're fussing them among one another. And by the way, listen to me. It is easy sometimes to become useless in God's work. There are many people out there tonight Many people today, you go out and visit. I just, just, I hope all of you go out and visit. You, you need to go. You need to go because that's what the Lord wants you to do. Now, you don't always have to meet George up here and do all that. You can do it on your own sometimes, but chances are you won't do it too much unless you sign up and say, unto God, I'm going to do it. But get out here and visit people and you'll find out that most of them will tell you, well, I'm a Christian. What? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, do you go to church? No, I haven't been in church in 20 years. No. Why don't you go? Well, the reason I don't go is is because I know some Christians that are meaner than snakes. <laughs> And I don't want to be around them. <coughs> oh, dear friends, listen to me. Go visit. Go visit. Go as a servant of God, but when you go out, you make sure that there's nothing in your life that'll keep you from being what God wants you to be. I tell you something. I am, I, I'm always amazed uh, at people we have two people, they're not members of our church. But I just got to say this about them. One of them is this guy comes every so often named Clarence. Clarence is one of the best witnesses I've run into. Amen. I mean, he just stands right up in the midst of a hundred people and he'll say, <coughs> you know, blessed be the Lord Jesus Christ. And he'll tell people, you know, he, he's not afraid to do it. And he lives his life that way. That's the way it should be with all of us. Another one, of course, is Brother uh, Arnell. Arnell Fast. And he lives it also, you see. That's a, here the, here's the disciples. Eh? They're fussing among themselves as to which one will be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Well, you know, you and I need to examine ourselves. And we need to do it every day. <laughs> you know, if you don't do it every day, listen, take the Word of God, read it, study it, however you do it, pick a chapter, whatever. Let God speak to your heart and then pray that God will use you that day in a mighty way and He'll do it. But He will not do it if there's sin in your life. The first thing you must do is confess your sin and get it out. And then God can truly use it. Three lessons here Jesus taught. You know, uh, these, are, these are so tremendous. First of all, we are to live our lives yielded completely unto Him. Your life totally and completely must be lived unto the Lord. <coughs> Not for self. Not for someone else, not for glory, not for any of those things, but that you might bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ and to His holy name. I pray you'll do that. 
Second thing he means here, suffering leads to glory. You know, faith will produce power. If we have faith, believe God, believe God, believe His Word, then we'll have power. And He wants to give us that power. <laughs> and in spite of all that, sacrifice will lead to honor. Even if we make mistakes, if we'll just simply come back to the Lord Jesus Christ and cry out to Him. Now, most of us know this, but let's just take Peter for an example. Peter sinned. Remember, we talked about that. He sinned. He denied the Lord Himself three times. But you know what? He came back to the Lord, he repented, he cried out to God, and God used him in a mighty way. I like to say to those people when they say to you, listen, I haven't been to church in 20 years. Yes, I'm a Christian, but I haven't been to church in 20 years. Come back to the Lord. Confess your sins. Come back to the Lord. God has something he wants you to do. He has something for you. If you'll just do it. And that's the way it is for us. Don't get caught up in pity, little uh, pity squabbles or anything like that. Just simply be what God has called you to be. Salt of the earth and the light of the world. Let us pray. Father, help us, Lord God, to be a servant. Help us to be a servant for you that we truly will not put ourselves up as number one, and we'll just simply be what you have called us to be in our lives. And then help us, Lord, if, there, if we get off track, we make mistakes, we say something, whatever it might be, that we confess it. And when we do that, you'll forgive us. And then we can go out and we can witness, we can tell other people about Jesus, Huh. And we can have such a wonderful, wonderful fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ because when we're doing what you'd have us to do, we won't be wondering who's going to be number one or what have you. So, Lord God, help us, direct us, guide us in the ways that you'd have us to go. And when we're in your will, doing your thing, then, we know everything will be all right in our lives. Help each one of us to examine ourselves. And if there's anything wrong or amiss, we ask you to forgive us, and you'll do it. We pray all of this in the precious name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth. He came the first time as a servant. But when he comes again, it'll be in his power and his glory. Forgive us, Lord, where we failed you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.